What's going on guys? My name is Matt and this is the ASRock A320M DGS, the cheapest AM4 motherboard on the market. It consistently goes for around $50 on Newegg and I actually used this motherboard in my personal computer for over a month to see what the experience was like using a very cheap AM4 motherboard. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the features of this motherboard, my experience using it, and also give you guys my opinion on who this board is for. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the video. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and go over the unboxing experience of this motherboard. It comes in a pretty standard motherboard box. Opening it up, we're first greeted by the motherboard itself in anti-static plastic. Under that, we find the motherboard manual. We find a disc with drivers on it, but don't use these drivers. Use the latest drivers from the ASRock website. We find a couple of SATA cables, the IO shield, as well as the screw for the M.2 drives. Now I'm going to pull the motherboard out of the bag and talk about its features. So I'm going to start by giving a quick physical tour of the motherboard itself. At the center of the motherboard, we find the AM4 socket which supports Ryzen 3, 5, and 7 CPUs along with the new APUs and Athlon CPUs that are based off of AMD's older architecture. Next to the AM4 socket, we find two DIMM slots that support up to 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM at up to 3200 plus megahertz. Under these, we find the PCIe expansion, which includes a 1x PCIe slot, a 4x Ultra M.2 slot, which also supports SATA M.2 drives, and under that, we find a 16x PCIe slot. I like this layout a lot because many times you find it switched where the 16x PCIe slot is above the 1x and M.2 slot, which means if you have a graphics card in there, you can't use the 1x M.2 slot. And it means that if you have a PCIe or SATA M.2 drive, it'll be kind of hidden by the graphics card. And a lot of the heat from the graphics card will go onto that drive. And in many cases, it can cause the drive to thermal throttle. So having it above the graphics card main 16x PCIe slot is a good move. And it's something I'm glad to see on this board. On this board, there are four 6 gigabit per second SATA 3 ports. There's your standard 4 pin power connector, standard 24 pin power connector, your standard front panel I.O. including USB 3, USB 2, and front panel audio. In terms of fan headers, there's one CPU fan header and one additional system fan header, both of which are 4 pin, which means that you're really only going to be able to have the CPU fan itself along with one system fan without using a fan hub or fan splitter. But honestly, for this A320 board, the kind of system you're gonna be running with this, one system fan should be enough. And if you want to add an additional fan, all you need to do is buy a fan splitter or fan hub of some sort. In terms of back panel IO, we have two USB 2 ports, a PS2 port, a DVI display out. We've got four USB 3, gigabit ethernet, and audio out. Now this has a pretty basic audio chipset, but I think for the kind of person that's going to be buying this board, it's going to be perfectly fine. The biggest difference between back panel I.O. that you're going to see between something like this and an entry level B350 board is going to probably just be a couple of USB 3 ports along with a few extra display out ports, which the display out ports don't really matter, especially if you're using a Ryzen CPU as there's no integrated graphics. So now I'm going to go ahead and take a minute and talk about the A320 chipset. In terms of AM4, there are three chipsets that are out right now, A320, B350, and X370. A320, which is on the board, is the most basic and gives you the base features of the AM4 platform. Going up to B350 allows you to overclock, gives you some extra I.O., as well as gives you support for limited AMD Crossfire. Bumping up to X370, you get full support for NVIDIA SLI as well as AMD Crossfire. So going with the A320 chipset, you're really getting the most budget and entry level options available on AM4 motherboards. The biggest drawback is that you can't overclock, which is basically taking away free performance as all Ryzen CPUs are able to be overclocked and they even can be overclocked 10 to 15% with their stock coolers. 
So now I'm going to talk about my experience actually using this board. Like I said in the intro, I used this board for over a month with my personal computer, which has a Ryzen 7 1700 and 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. Obviously, I couldn't overclock, so I had to leave things at stock settings for the CPU, but installing the 16 gigs of RAM, it ran fine at 3200 megahertz in dual channel operation. All I had to do was when I assembled the computer, I went into BIOS, selected the 3200 megahertz XMP profile, and it booted up just fine. In terms of expansion and IO, this worked perfectly fine for me. Really, the six USB ports were enough as I don't connect too many devices, and also having two USB 3 ports on the front of my PC helped with that as well. In my system, I don't use a lot of PCIe expansion. I just use a the 16x PCIe slot for a graphics card, as well as the Ultra M.2 slot, both of which work perfectly fine on this board. And I don't have many SATA drives connected, usually only one at a time. So the four SATA ports weren't limiting to me at all. Overall, this fit my needs, but there wasn't any room for future expansion. And the fact that I couldn't overclock seemed like a pretty big hindrance and seemed like it was taking away free performance around 10 to 15% that can easily be attained out of the R7-1700 by using it with a decent B350 board. But that's just my experience with it. Hopping on to Amazon, I found mostly good reviews on this motherboard from people who are actually buying it. There were a couple of one-star reviews, but most of the one-star reviews seemed to be from people who were mad that they couldn't overclock on this board, which just seems to me that they were uninformed and purchased the wrong chipset of board. So now I'm going to go ahead and talk about who I think should buy this board. If you've got an 8-core Ryzen 7 or a 6-core Ryzen 5, I think you should be getting yourself at least the B350 chipset if not an X370 chipset, because if you can truly take advantage of six or eight cores, then you're definitely gonna wanna take advantage of overclocking, as well as the extra connectivity that the B350 and X370 boards are going to give you. Now, if you're using a four core Ryzen 5 or four core Ryzen 3, this is where I start to think the A320 chipset might make sense for you. Now, there are a group of people out there who want nothing to do with overclocking. They just wanna install their parts and be up and running. They don't wanna to have to deal with temps or stability or anything that goes along with overclocking. And for those people, I think this motherboard could do just fine. But with that being said, if you even think you might want to overclock in the future, then I would recommend spending the extra 20 or 30 bucks on a B350 board so that at least you have that option in the future. So conclusion time. Do I think this board is worth it for $50? Yes and no. I think for a certain group of people, a small niche group of people, this board could work perfectly fine. But if you're comfortable with overclocking or buying one of the mid to high end Ryzen CPUs, then I definitely think you should go for at least the a B350 chipset board. Overall, I don't think this is a bad board. I just think the A320 chipset is pretty limiting in that the vast majority of people will benefit by going with the B350 board. So yeah, guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up as well as consider subscribing for more PC and tech related content in the future. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.